This is Stanford Engineering's The Future of Everything, and I'm your host, Russ Altman. Today, Professor Nick Bloom from Stanford University will tell us that work from home is here to stay. It's increasing, it's impacting the economies of cities and suburbs, and there are technologies coming down the pike that are going to help make it easier so it will continue to grow. It's the future of work at home. Before that pandemic, work from home was a novelty. Some of us got on conference calls every now and then or got on a phone, but mostly people went to an office and did their work. Then the pandemic happened and things started moving very quickly. Many people went to full-time work at home, others went to hybrid, and in the years since the pandemic began, there's been a shift so that a large fraction of people are doing what we call hybrid work, partly from home, partly in an office. This has changed the economies of downtown cities. Mayors are worried about their tax bases. It has changed the prices of homes in suburbia. Uh, and there's been technology developments where things like Zoom have just gotten incredibly better. So the question is, is work from home here to stay? Nick Bloom is a professor of economics at Stanford University. He studies productivity and innovation, and he's been focusing recently on work from home policies and economic impacts. He's talked to hundreds of companies, and he will tell us that work from home, hybrid work, where you're working a little bit in an office and a little bit from home, is going to take off. But so will totally remote work, where you never go into the office. Indeed, some companies have already adopted it. He'll tell us how this impacts the economy of cities, the prices of houses in the suburbs, and how technologies are being developed that will really make all of this just go forward faster. It's the future of work. So, Nick. Uh, work from home is down on everybody's mind. Uh, you're, you're an expert at productivity, entrepreneurship, innovation. Um, is this work at home phenomenon just a blip because of a booming economy before the pandemic and then the pandemic? Uh, and now in a world where, where people are thinking about recession and tighter belts, is there going to be a huge pressure to move away from it? Great question. And no, it's not a blip. Uh, it is very much permanent. So to give you some sense, before the pandemic, work from home in the US was pretty rare. So about 5% of days. It then exploded in the pandemic to about 60%. So like anyone that could work from home, me, you, probably everyone listening was doing it pretty much full time. It's then dropped down to about 30%, where it's flatlined for the last, you know, six, seven months. And that looks like it's the future. So Where's that 30% come from? There's a group of people, about 15% of Americans that are fully remote. They're mostly like payroll processing benefits, you know, IT support. And then there's another group, about 30% of people, probably pretty much most folks listening, us, that are like hybrid. <laughs> and we are two days, three days a week in the office, yes. two, three days a week at home. And that's, you know, we're, I'm happy to talk about the future, but where we are now, things have stabilized. They've been flat, actually, since mid-2022. So let me ask, I'm going to push back a little bit because I understand how during a period where, they, where, where employers were desperate to hire, it was like yes to any request that a potential employee made. Now we're hearing about layoffs, tightening. Is there going to be pressure on workers in order to kind of show enthusiasm, teamwork, blah, blah, blah. Is there going to be pressure on them to come back to the office, even perhaps when they could be perfectly productive, not in the office? I'm wondering what the dynamics might change in a tougher economy. A little bit, not much. And I should say it cuts both ways. I've talked to probably, I don't know, by now about a thousand plus organizations about this. And I'm hearing on the one hand, you're right. There's like some senior typically more traditional slash older managers that have had 30 years of working in person and kind of want to go back. On the other hand, there's a bunch of firms and organizations that have said, look, when times are tougher, we're thinking of getting rid of the office or we're downsizing and there's just no ability to come back in. So on average, it looks like those, you know, for the last few months and going forward to netting out. So yeah. I don't see, I mean, I have, the future as in three, five, 10 years out, it's very clear it's going to be higher than it is now. But certainly in the next year, I don't see much change. So you can see I'm one of these old guys who's resisting, and, and that's fine. <laughs> uh, but so let me just continue to resist a little bit. I think that most of the data we have is on the so short-term impacts when, a, when an employee had been, uh, had been local and, and present, and then they go home, and then it, it kind of works because the relationships have been established and everything can kind of gain from, get, benefit from the momentum of the previous relationships. 
Have there been studies by you or others on the longer term impacts when perhaps people are hired and like never have that by the water cooler experience? And are the teams as effective and is the work as good under those circumstances? Okay, so there, there are two, you're totally right. On, so there are two very different concepts. So one is fully remote where you just never come in. You're working from home five days a week in perpetuity. There are definitely a studies. There's one in nature. There's one in nature, human behavior. There's a bunch of stuff showing that is damaging for innovation. That's damaging for mentoring, for connectivity. Okay. Now, you then may ask, why would firms do it? And they do it because of two big upsides, which is one is you save on space, which is you know, 20 30% of payroll. That's pretty huge. And the other is you can hire globally. On the other hand, this hybrid which is, say, a typical you know, plain vanilla star would be work from home Monday, Friday, come in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and really vibrant, really lively. Yes. That doesn't look like there's any real downsides. You have as much face time as before, but you just pushed them into three super social days, and then you had two days to kind of quiet, read, write, deep work at home. Yes, and, and, and that I think that is probably the kind of thing you and I are doing uh, with with fair amount of success. In that model, however, let's talk about the uh, infrastructure. The space issue, I think, is very fascinating. Um, what are people doing? What are these companies doing when you talk to them about the fact that if they have two or three days a week where it's well populated, that means four days a week this office could be a ghost town. And that's expensive. So are we looking at an entirely reconfigured workspace? And are, they, are people coming up with creative ways to lay out a workspace so that um, you're not wasting four out of seven days of rent? So this, this is you know, a key question. So I've worked on working from home for 20 years. And before the pandemic, the big driver is space. And in fact, the word hybrid didn't exist. So before the pandemic, work from home basically meant you sent people home five days a week and you closed the office. And the big motivation is to cut space. You're absolutely correct. On the hybrid, it's really hard. And, you know, I've worked, for example, a lot with Stanford University with hundreds of organizations and they're tearing their hair out and saying, you know, folks are just coming in Tuesday to Thursday. Those are the popular days. What are we going to do about it? Now, you can save space on average. Very few firms are doing because it's painful. What you have to do is you have to say team A, you're in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, team B, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, team C, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, etc. But then there's some pretty high cost of that. One is some folks are going to come in on Fridays and Mondays and they don't want to do it. And B, they're not all overlapping. So even right. if A and B don't work with each other, they both work with C. Then So when I talk to companies, they're mostly organizations. I mean, I talked to a lot of universities actually as well. They say, in the future, 24, 25, we're going to use like office booking software, smart stuff to figure this out. Uh. But right now, it is just so complicated. Let's just get hybrid up and running on three you know, days. Uh, and then in the future, we'll come back and we'll do you know, the second step. Great, great. So you've written some really interesting stuff. And one, one um, I think it was a publication, was about who should decide who works remotely, how much remotely they work. There was a sense that, you know, I think there was a quote in one of your papers. Oh, we we trust our employees, and we're going to let them decide what their uh, work from home schedule should be. Uh, but some of your comments just now about A, B, and C. Um, uh, how do we train managers to uh, to manage the issue of uh, what could be a delicate negotiation about work from home and and then work at work? Uh, arrangements. Yeah, I, you know, I have to say, maybe like all academics, you know, as the data comes in, I've changed my mind. So I in 2020 uh, was in favor of choice. And from surveys and studies, I've done two randomized control trials on this. Um, I think it's a problem. The reason is, when you ask people why they want to come into the office, they basically want to come in to work with colleagues and socialize with colleagues. So that means you've really got to coordinate. You know, you can imagine if there's, you know, the two of us from Brian, you know, you're in Monday, I'm in Tuesday, he's on Wednesday. It just doesn't work. And you heard right. stories from 2021 of people saying, I came in and I, there's no one here. I spent all day on right. Zoom. And so that means somebody's got to coordinate. It turns out most people want to work from home on Monday and Friday. So the choice is reasonably straightforward. You, if you're going to do two days, it's typically, you know, Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday, Wednesday. If it's three, you just pick the middle three. Right. That seems to work well. You're correct. It wastes space. And so... That's the challenge. 
I, you know, I can get into, you know, talking about the future, I'm actually involved in a couple of startups that are using space planning software. And the way that's going to pan out eventually is every person feeds in who they work with, what facilities they want, which days they want to go in, and some big algorithm spits it out and kind of gets, look, you know, roughly... I think you only work with these people who can kind yes. of configure it to come in, but it's really complicated actually. And so that we're not really there quite yet. So it sounds like the days where my cubby is filled with pictures of my dog and my kids and, and an, an expression of my <laughs> unique personality <laughs> That it's either going to go away or I'm going to need to be able to very quickly pack it down, bring it to a new cubicle and reset it up in order to get that same flavor at work. Yeah, exactly. In fact, that's another reason why this desk sharing thing is hard. You know, you don't have your own space and there's sometimes issues with confidentiality. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, the other comment on that is what's interesting is offices are changing in different ways. So they're mostly not moving out of cities. They're mostly not downsizing. But there's been a huge rush towards much more meeting space. So back in 2019, we'll come in, there'd be a lot of sat at your cubicle, Dilbert style, working right. away. That right. reading, writing, quiet stuff is now being pushed to Monday and Friday. Tuesday, yep. Wednesday, Thursday, there's a lot of meetings. So more meeting rooms, what are called Zoom cubicles. They're like yes. little, you know, booths so people can have Zoom or Teams calls. Um, you know, one firm I was talking to has been putting sensors in every room of the office. And it's kind of cool. And they just said, we discovered meeting rooms. No one can get them. They're like so popular. We put in sensors. Turns out they're mostly filled with one person taking like yeah. a Zoom call to another office. And now we put in these booths, said, look, if you want to have a one person call, that's great. Go and use one of the booths. It's liberated up the meeting room. So those are the changes. It's much more about getting rid of ranks of offices and little cubicles and converting them to common, common space. Yeah, this is great. So another topic that is just fascinating to me and, and that you've worked on a little bit is the impact of all this on like downtowns and on cities. And, and, and you've written about mayors and how mayors are trying to strategize about their tax base. Of course, we know when there, when there's an office complex, there are cafes, there are places for lunch, there are uh, gyms. Uh, and this could also what, what can you tell me about the future of how the cities themselves, not just the offices, which you've given us a nice little preview to, but the surrounding infrastructure, what's going to happen? Yes. Yeah, so I, I, we call it the donut effect. And that's an American donut with nothing in the middle rather than the British one with a jam center. So uh, with, you know, uh, uh, Arjun Romani, called here, we've got both U.S. United States Postal Service change of address, like the, it's amazing data and also Zillow data. You see it very clearly during the pandemic and, you know, including now, people have basically moved out a bit from city centers out to the suburbs. So if me or you, you know, you work in some firm and you're only going to come in two, three days a week, you think, look, why don't I just move out to the suburb? I can put up with a longer commute, but I get a home office. And that has happened en masse. And it's actually pushed up prices, property prices, rents, of the suburbs of big cities. So a typical yes. person has actually left central New York. They've not gone to, you know, rural Wyoming because they're still going to go in two days a week. They've gone to, you know, some suburb like Queens or somewhere. Same in San Francisco, as we know, it's become very popular in East Bay and Tahoe and the city. So one thing is there's been a lot of movement of people out. And if you're trying to rent in the suburbs, that's why your rent is exploded because everyone else right. is trying to do that. That's also affected offices and retail. So office demand is soft in city centers. But in some ways, the biggest effect is on retail. So folks like Starbucks and, you know, uh, Pret-a-Manger, et cetera, Panera Bread, they are... Dunkin' Donuts. Exactly. In the, in the East Coast, at least. They are killing it in the suburbs, but are suffering in city centers. So in some ways, that's not bad at all. I don't think as an economist and looking across the whole country, you just shifted activity and, you know, the city centers are very expensive. So maybe it's good to move stuff out. The, the only problem is folks like London Breed and Eric Adams, the mayors are seeing London Breed is in some ways the biggest struggle in San Francisco. She's seen a lot of tax activity, a lot of economic activity move out from core San Francisco to places that are not very far away. Me and you even probably think of them as still as San Francisco, but right. they're not covered in her tax base. And so she's lost a lot of money. And at the same time, transit, Caltrain, BART, you know, the New York subway is seeing ridership levels permanently down 35%. So other sources of money. So generally, this is great in a way. It's kind of quiet and city centers made them a bit less crushingly expensive. But the one group that is most upset, understandably, is the mayor's of these yes. cities because they've lost they've lost money 
Are we starting to see entrepreneur, entrepreneurial approaches to this softening of like where we see this, 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 this softening, I'm sure other people are seeing opportunities. And have you seen some creative, like new ways to use these spaces or, or, or ways to replace the retailers with different things for which there is demand? Great. So in some ways, you'd think this was perfect. If I took you in a time capsule back to 2019, you know, you and I remember for Stanford and around, you know, many big cities, it was so expensive to hire. We were struggling here right. to hire folks because they just couldn't afford to live. And so if you move people out, it pushes prices down in city centers. The You're right now... A bit of space, particularly retail office space, has come vacant. There is a yeah. move to try and convert that to residential, which is great. The yes. challenge is in some places, so there's two types. So for little kind of what I would call European style offices, small, you know, not too big, that works reasonably well. The problem is from those 1980s onwards, massive glass skyscrapers. They yes. don't have enough bathrooms. There's not enough windows. In fact, in some places like New York has a regulation that every bathroom has to have a window. So what are you going to do? Oh, like, my goodness. Yeah. So it's turning out that is where the real challenge is. So I think some stuff, particularly smaller offices, are going to convert. The bigger ones, it's honestly hard. It's hard to know. Maybe the planning regulations change and you allow entirely internal you know, rooms uh, and say, look, we're better off having these things for people living them in some internal rooms rather than empty, boarded up offices. It's an amazing, it's an amazing thing that you've just told me because I know, you know, from my job as a professor, I deal with young people in their twenties all day. They want to be in cities. They want to be mixing, meeting each other. Uh, that was always a difficulty in recruiting graduate students. Is you know, well. Stanford is a little bit of a sleepy town. And if you're a young person who wants to meet and mix, uh, so there is an opportunity there, but you're right. Some of these buildings might actually have to come down and be replaced with places where people want to live. But but that could then create, again, as you're saying, a whole new economic hub for activity. Well, this is the future of everything, and we'll have more with Nick Bloom next. Welcome back to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman, and I'm speaking with Nick Bloom from Stanford University. In the last segment, Nick told us that the current status of work from home is a lot of hybrid work and some remote, totally remote work from home. In this segment, he's going to tell us about the future, how there are technologies being developed that will only increase the use of work at home, both hybrid and for totally remote. He's also going to talk about how cities are going to have to adapt. There are large office buildings that might need to turn into apartment buildings for young people to live. Prices in the suburbs are going up. And Starbucks are starting to make more money in the suburbs than they used to make in the cities. So it's all changing. When this all settles down, where are we going to be? So tell me, what are you seeing as the, uh, e the new equilibrium for the future of work? Right. You know, it's, it's odd to say one of the things you're most confident about is predicting the future. But in this case, I'll tell you what it is, and I'll explain very, very simply why. So... You know, in economics and business, there's something called market size effects. If a market gets a lot bigger, people put more money into investing in it. You know, for example, as Americans have got older, there's more drugs aimed at, you know, aging diseases. So we've seen this on steroids for work from home. Bef before the pandemic in the US, it was about 5% of days. It's now 30%. That six-fold increase has been replicated pretty much around the world. So what it means is like every hardware, software company from Microsoft, from Google to Apple to all the startups we work with in Silicon Valley around the world are really focused on getting better technology to support work from home. Yes. And that's going to mean if you run the thing five, 10 years out, we're going to see amazing improvements, things like holograms, augmented reality, virtual reality, much better cameras, connectivity, software. This is going to push up the levels of work from home. So it's pretty easy to predict five years from now and clearly 10 years, we'll be working from home substantially more not than we are now. So, you know, in the short run, sure, there's a recession. We drop a little bit, not much, but five, certainly 10 years out, the direction of travel is very clearly up. So that's fascinating because what you just said is basically the stuff that I hear about, about virtual reality and the metaverse, which I have to admit, I pretty much discard, but I think of it as something for gamers and I'm just not a gamer, uh, you know, guilty. But <laughs> it sounds like this is not going to be about games. This is going to be about those same types of technologies facilitating work. Yeah, so why don't I give you two examples? It's easier to look back because it's hard to predict which technologies, but you know the general direction. So if I look back, I've been working on this for 20 years. Go back, let's say, just over a decade to 2010. 
in that era, there was no cloud, really. A, you know, AWS, Azure, et cetera, wasn't around. Dropbox was founded around that era. So, And there was also no video calls. So Zoom right. Teams didn't exist. So if you go back to 2010, the way you would work from home is, you know, conference calls on freeconferencetool.com and emailing files, maybe sending it through the mail. I mean, it was just horrible. And yeah. that rate of technical change has been huge. If you look ahead, it's going to pick up. Now, what it is, is harder to call. I heard an interview of the founder of Dropbox, and fascinatingly, he said, look, when I founded this, it was aimed at techies because no one else had more than one computer, and it turned out to be pretty critical. So I, I'm not a big, I don't use the metaverse either. That's not something I'm hearing about from companies. What I am hearing about, you know, take, take Zoom or Teams. They all introduced during the pandemic, raise hand, virtual backgrounds, many yeah. more windows, a whole set of stuff that doesn't seem a big deal. But now, if you took all of that back, if you try and use, you know, those programs from March 2020, they're not great. So there'll be a lot of in the short run what will seem quite incremental. But we're going to go to, you know, 2030 and think, and this will be so much better. And what it will mean is all of us may spend an extra day a week at home. Some people who coming in five days a week may be able to work, you know, a day a week at yes. home. Like a good anecdote is my, my neighbor across the road, she's a doctor. And she said pre-pandemic is all in person. And she said now she does one day a week telemedicine because both she and the patients want it. There's some stuff that actually is a quick, it's a prescription update or something, you know, getting tests back. It is just amazing. I had a pulled neck muscle during the pandemic, and I did a 100% of my physical therapy with an iPad in my living room, where she would say, no, 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 you're not doing it right. <laughs> Stretch this way. I want to see you straighten your back. It was just amazing that I could do physical therapy in my, in my own. Um, okay, so um, two questions. First of all, uh, your, your, this technical progress raises the possibility that we might have an increasing population of people who are fully remote. Is that what you're kind of suggesting? And tell me about, because I know in our conversation even, you've been distinguishing between the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and the never people. Um, I, are you seeing a, a, a likely shift? Yeah, so I, again, I'll give you numbers and talk about the future. So currently in the US, about 55% of people can't work from home at all. So they, you know, you can imagine frontline retail manufacturing, etc. Of the rest, 30% are hybrid, 15% are fully remote. The fully remote is a much more radical decision. So there are some companies that do it like Airbnb and Yelp. When you talk, you know, uh, Quora, uh, Upwork, etc. I've spoken to a lot of the CEOs of these companies and they say, look, the benefits for firms, you know, you save an office space and you can hire globally. But the downside is it's harder for innovation. It's a lot harder for mentoring, for creating culture. So generally, yeah. that isn't growing that much apart from startups. Interesting, startups, fully remote is a big thing for startups because it's cheap. And actually, I think a lot of startups are starting up by people that currently have a job and, you know, doing their startup yes. on that. They're doing both fully remote. So... In the long run, yes, it will pick up. I think the big growth is actually going to be hybrid folks adding a day a week, say, from home. Or people, you know, for example, I spoke to Satya Nadella at Microsoft. It's pretty fascinating. He said they have these stores and they sell these hardware products. And you think that has to be a fully in-person job. He yeah. said there's been a lot of pickup of people buying, you know, hardware online. And you yes. also need people to do the chat function, and sometimes they do Teams calls. And so folks are maybe now in store four days a week and work from home to do the online store on the Fridays. This is a job, we think. It's obviously a retail job. It's in person. Even that at the margin is going to, you know, hybrid. You are absolutely right. I've recently noticed that the quality of chat support for various buying decisions that I make has gotten astronomically better than it was <laughs> five years ago. And um, OK, I wanted to make sure we touched upon what the impact on the makeup of the workforce is. And it, this might be a differential impact for, for example, young mothers or young fathers or, or um, people who are living far away in, the, in rural areas. So what are you what are you learning or thinking about the future of how the workforce will be impacted, perhaps differentially by the trends that we've been discussing? Great. So. Again, there's some really interesting stuff here. Some also some tremendously positive opportunities. So firstly, a, a couple of facts. So it turns out young people, so folks in their 20s, are the least keen, certainly on fully remote. So one thing is, 
you notice that age is a big determinant of people's favor of to, to, you know preferences on being more remote so if you talk to 20 somethings they're like i want to be mentored i want to be social often there are you know we have this with our students they're like look there are five of us sharing an apartment there's only one living room and i don't want to work in my bedroom so what you know i want to go into work so it turns out as you look in the data we've surveyed by now i think 200 that we've been serving 10,000 people a month in the u.s and another 10,000 globe globally it turns out that uh, as you get into your 40s, people have a higher preference to work remotely. The reason is folks in their 40s have young kids, they have a house, they have more space. So one is there's a strong age gradient. People often ask a lot about gender. It yeah. turns out there isn't a huge variation in levels of work from home by gender. Women have a slightly higher preference, but not enormous. The much bigger gaps you see are having young children, both men and women with young children have a much stronger preference to work from home. And the other group is around disability. So if you have either you know disability from life or you're aging into it, we see a strong preference there. And that's where I think there's enormous benefits in the long run. So one thing I think it's gonna open up is a lot of folks that are disabled or maybe people with young kids or clo folks close to retirement. So I think of my parents, they you know went from full on work to kind of retirement and it it doesn't make really very much sense to go from 50 hours plus commuting a week to suddenly nothing what for a lot of folks you know in that age group it would be look you can actually now work say 3 days a week of which one of them is at home how would that yeah. suit and that is very appealing and it's going to push up what we think about as labor supply so there'll be a lot yeah. of people that will come back slightly earlier part time from work after kids that will work a bit longer students and for an economy that's great you know that will help you know, increase growth, keeps people happy. Generally, they can work a bit. Will actually help reduce inflation. So, that is another very positive impact of work from home. Yeah, that is great to hear because even as a even as a professor, which is like like you, I am. I worry about like the day that I say, okay, I'm not a professor anymore, and I go from a hundred to zero. Uh, and this idea that there might be ways for me to ratchet down over several years is extremely appealing. And the other thing you mentioned, which is makes a perfect sense, is that. People who are working remotely, they might be able to arrange their day so that they have a couple of jobs. And there's a whole issue, which I don't think we have to get into, about <laughs> disclosing disclosing your full set of activities to your employer. But but I, I just want to end. Uh, you said one thing that I wanted to cap or jump on, which is this is indeed a global phenomenon. I didn't know the degree to which this is a U.S. or a Western Europe and U.S. thing. Are other economies, India, China, Africa, are they all seeing the same trends? Yes, the, exactly. The trends is the perfect word. So levels are different. So the US, Canada, UK have about 30% of days work from home. That's kind of the, up, the highest tier, Scandinavia, actually. You go to Southern Europe, Central Southern Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, you're more like 20%. You go to Asia, Japan, China, it's more like 15. You go to kind of South America, Africa, it's even lower. But the change has been similar because they both started lower before the pandemic. Right. So right. globally, I mean, I, I've talked to, you know, this morning, I was talking to someone in, in uh, Sweden and, you know, I talked to some folks in Germany and Denmark and Singapore and Brazil and Indonesia. I mean, I'm seeing the same thing around the world that particularly graduates. So if you look at graduates around the world, it's become very standard to have one to two days a week now work from home. And so that, that really is the new normal. So there you see it, the future of the future of work. Thanks very much to Nick Bloom. That was the future of work from home. You have been listening to The Future of Everything with Russ Altman. You can follow me on Twitter at RB Altman for now, and you can follow Stanford Engineering at Stanford ENG.